you know, she was kind of like the Oprah Winfrey of her day, the Oprah Winfrey of her town, you know, just doing good. In 1946, an African-American woman walks into Wanamaker's department store in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It is the height of shopping in that city, opened in 1876, and it was a place that attracted wealthy shoppers, particularly in the fur department. A young white sales girl that working in the fur department notices this woman, Sarah Spencer Washington, well-dressed with a silk brocade dress, a tailored wool coat, leather handbag, excellent hair, makeup, like all of the customers that she should be serving. But not today. The sales girl ignores her. And Washington starts looking at the furs. Minutes pass. Still ignored. Then... The head of the fur department walks in and recognizes her and says, Mrs. Washington, back so soon? She says, I'd like to get one more if I may, referring to a mink coat. The supervisor sees what has taken place with the sales girl and orders the sales girl to get another mink for Miss Washington. And Miss Washington writes a check for $4,600, which you must understand, at this time, in 1946, is the average cost of a house. She was in a position, financially, to do anything she wanted with her money, quite honestly. That is Cheryl Woodruff Brooks, and she is the author of Chicken Bone Beach, a pictorial history of Atlantic City's Missouri Avenue Beach by Sunbury Press. She is also the author of Golden Beauty Boss, the story of Madam Sarah Spencer Washington and the Apex Empire. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about Sarah Spencer Washington. It's called an empire because she has 45,000 salespeople nationwide working for her that sell Apex Beauty products door to door. She opened about 12 beauty schools in 12 different states across the U.S. She starts a nursing home, a hotel, a campsite for African-American youth with 20 acres of farmland. She's a high-profile figure in the 1930s and 40s. And yet, she's still barred from whites-only restaurants. She presides over a compounding lab, a factory, a warehouse, an office, a drugstore, More than that, she employs lots of people and helps them earn an income, sometimes as much as $90 a week, good income. She sometimes gives them loans to start their own beauty salons and give them a deal on Apex products so they could become self-sufficient. And yet, when she had to use the beach, it was a two-block area of Atlantic City's Missouri Avenue Beach, the same as would happen with Martin Luther King, the same as would happen with Sammy Davis Jr. When she was refused service at Captain Starnes, a whites-only Atlantic City seafood restaurant that refused to seat her, she took them to court and sued and won. So we'll talk today about Madam Spencer Washington, an African-American woman millionaire of the 1920s. We are talking to Cheryl Woodruff Brooks, the author of Golden Beauty Boss, the story of Madam Sarah Spencer Washington and the Apex Empire. Cheryl, thanks for coming on. My history can beat up your politics. Thanks for having me. She sounds like an exceptional woman. I mean, she would have to be for in that period as an African-American woman to be a millionaire. Absolutely. And her story is very similar to a few other African-American female giant in the hair care industry. Unfortunately, her story hasn't been heard prior to these last few years, but now the rest of the world will know. Talk a bit about like hair care as an industry for African-American women or even men in, in the 1920s. It was 
kind of an accessible industry. It's something to do that's not having to be a uh, domestic worker in, in someone's house. Sure. So post-slavery era did not provide a lot of opportunities for African Americans. I mean, at this point, a lot of them had acquired limited skills such as sharecropping and cleaning, various types of domestic work, taking care of children. And so due to the fact that this market, the African-American female in America, did not have a lot of, a lot of choices as far as hair care, mm -hmm. as far as consumer goods to take care of their hair and their beauty needs, uh, it was just an, a perfect opportunity for people such as Madam Sarah Spencer Washington to come on the scene and provide not only consumer goods and services, but to assist other African-American people to stretch out and become entrepreneurs. Um, so it, the, the timing could not have been better really for uh, people such as herself and the historical Madam C.J. Walker to, um, to find their own niche finally in a society that still was far from true equality. And there was competition, and you had to be good. She was a great door-to-door -door salesperson, among many things. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this Madam Sarah Spencer Washington was a very young lady when she started, too. I believe she was about 19 years old. Uh, but at least she had had an opportunity to witness two other African-American women who were pursuing the same interests as her. And I'm sure she, you know, um, decided, hey, I'm going to do just like they did. So, yeah, she had to be confident and um, aggressive. She did go door to door because those were the days of marketing. I mean, um, you know, vacuum cleaners and encyclopedias. And so she traveled throughout her neighborhood offering to um, do demonstrations of her her beauty products, her makeup to women. And they were, you know, they embraced it because they didn't have very many choices. So it did take a lot of assertiveness on her part to pursue her goal. But it just reading her history, it sounds like she was um, a very focused individual, quite an intelligent young lady who built a great network of people to help her pursue this dream. And in addition to the uh, hair care products, she also, a component of this was also education and schools for people that would then learn to start their own business. Yes. So along with selling hair care products and herself being a hairstylist, she ventured out to begin to open um, beauty schools. And I mean, what an endeavor. She opened about 12 beauty schools in 12 different states across the U.S. And, um, and ultimately, as she grew older, she franchised out a few of them. But, you know, when you think about what America was like in the 1930s and 40s, um, people of any color, quite honestly, were uh, in great need of employment and the African-American community in particular. So women flocked, and a few men, to her beauty school to learn skills that they knew would set them up to be able to open their own hair salon or teach themselves. Many of them um, were quite successful. In fact, uh, one of the few African-American men that uh, attended her beauty school started a company called Bronner Brothers. Uh, Mr. Bronner had was married and gave birth to all sons, but he actually attended one of the Apex Beauty Colleges and started his own hair care products and huge hair shows and conferences, and he employed his sons to keep it going. So now he's deceased, but his children are keeping the business going. So she was definitely an asset to Atlantic City and uh, the country at large. The fruits of her labor did not quite go unnoticed, although I think she was worthy of a lot more. She was recognized at the World Trade Exhibit in 1939 for her 
her business um, savvy. In Atlantic City, she's part of the, the local business boards. Yeah. Sheriff Luther Washington, again, very confident, very courageous woman in Atlantic City. They truly embraced and provided opportunities to people of color to grow their own businesses. So the, the Black population of Atlantic City during the early 1900s were uh, very big business owners. They weren't prohibited from starting their own endeavors. They may have had to deal with various types of discrimination, but um, they were definitely given that opportunity. So Sarah was seen as a very uh, well-respected business owner because of the fact that she had accomplished so much. She built this manufacturing plant in Atlantic City and opened a lab as well. And so she was adding value economically to the city of of Atlantic City. And um, because of that, you know, they respected her insight and her input. And I have to say that her voice was um, utilized for more than just building wealth. But being the voice of the Black community and to ensure that they were given equal opportunities to succeed. When uh, Blacks are not allowed into the local golf course, she she buys and builds her own. How about that, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, she um, you know, and you hear these stories of a few um uh, people of color who were in her position financially weren't a lot, but yeah, she she understood the power of the dollars she earned and contributed in society and used that as a tool to um, level the playing field when and where she could. And so in her hometown, um, not only did she uh, open the golf course, she bought a drugstore. She opened a few different businesses, in fact, that I think were driven by the fact that she wanted the African-American citizens in her community and surrounding areas to uh, be, able, be able to enjoy the same amenities as everyone else is doing. Yeah, let's talk a bit about the area. It's an area I'm very familiar with. I love Atlantic City, and not, not just casino-wise, but um, I go down there to visit. And I went to Stockton. Uh, at that time, it was Stockton State College myself uh, many moons ago. <laughs> I have been communicating back and forth with them about um, being involved in more um, activities going on as it relates to Sarah Spencer Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, because of the pandemic, unfortunately, I missed my first opportunity to do a discussion there. Most of my Atlantic City assistants came from the Atlantic City Free Public Library, and they have archived a couple of collections I looked at, but they they have a collection of um, information, photos, artifacts on Sarah Spencer Washington, so I utilize them a great deal, Um, but of course, as a researcher (laughs) writing a book, you know, it's I also did quite a few oral histories as well, um, and I also visited um, the uni- uh, let me get the name right. the Pennsylvania Historical Society in Philadelphia, um, and I probably <laughs> could have bounced around to a few more states because of the fact that her businesses. Um, or successful in a few different places. I I could have very well done some research physically in Baltimore. Um, I did so in Philadelphia, but but Atlantic City um, played the biggest part in uh, my gathering a lot of research. That's where it really grows, and Atlantic City, I guess at this time, in the north side particularly, has a large African-American community there and is it is one of the major population particularly i mean definitely in south jersey um and that's where she she gets her start i don't think people get familiar um you know it's just not something that people are, are familiar with because when they hear atlantic city 
it's all about uh, casinos. Yeah, which is why I was so grateful to have stumbled upon um, this information, you know, because I knew that outside of people very familiar with Atlantic City, they, did, they, weren't, they weren't aware of Madam Sarah Spencer Washington or just the African-American history. African-Americans have been a part of Atlantic City since Atlantic City became who it is today. Um, there were a group of slaves who were given their freedom from a, a Dutchman by the name of James Soma. He agreed to provide these women their freedom if they would take pebbles and create a path for him to be able to, uh, I guess, I don't know, ride his horse or walk to Atlantic City. Um, yeah. It was actually called Abseekin at the time. So it didn't even have its name yet. It was named by the Native Americans. They called it the Place of Swans. It's, it's just one of those cities where there were blacks in Atlantic City from the very beginning, and they had no choice but to live on the north side. So the, 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 the city was racially divided by a train. A train rode through. It separated the north side from the south side. Uh, it wasn't the greatest area at all. I, I viewed pictures. Um, decades went by before this, their side had uh, streets paved. Um, there were no uh, playgrounds for kids. So they, they lacked a lot of amenities. So they were kind of crunched into this small little area. But, uh, but still just a very fascinating community uh, in general. Um, I mean, you get a little bit for, um, for the average, let's say, American, like watching TV and learning everything from what they watch, let's say, a little bit on Boardwork Empire. You know, there's a little depiction of the community there, but it's all poetic license. Uh, so it's good to hear yeah. uh, about the real community. Uh, she intersects with one of the traditions of Atlantic City with the Miss America pageant, right? Because I got, uh, I think that um, there's a story in your book about her and um, and uh, the ex- the discrimination that African Americans experienced with that pageant in originally, and and she uh, guess started her own. She started a parade, which was a, a part of the Miss America fanfare. So back in the um, 1920s, when Miss America started, alongside the pageant itself was a bit of um, uh, additional activities taking place in the city to sort of promote the whole Miss America idea. And so Atlantic City would annually um, have an uh, Easter parade. They'd have this huge, I don't know if it was Easter, or let's just say they had an annual parade and selected uh, women um, to be a part of it, mm-hmm. even if they weren't an actual pageant contestant. So if it's in Washington, repeatedly entered women of color into the pageant parade, so to speak, and just was denied. They gave out awards. So they gave out awards. They never picked a woman of color. They they never picked one or a group of them to participate in the parade um, until after she passed. And her adopted daughter actually continued the pursuit and she was instrumental for finally getting um, a float in their parade. But while Sarah Spencer Washington was alive, um, after so many um, incidents of rejection, she just started a, an annual Easter parade on the north side of town. That's what many African Americans did at that time in America. If they were not being included, they would separate themselves and host their own events, but I feel as though Madam Sarah Spencer Washington was 
initially instrumental in getting women of color in the Miss America uh, pageant because she was the first person to present women of color to that agency, even though it didn't happen for years and years and years. She was already a voice Mm -hmm. knocking at the door saying, please include us. She's also a philanthropic person. I mean, giving out coal to people that needed it, which was would have been real important at that time um, to have a, a uh, start a nursing home, uh, to helping to sell war bonds when we got into World War II. I think those uh, pieces of information um, is what made me love her story uh, so very much that... Um, she was in a position financially to um, do anything she wanted with her money, quite honestly, um, but took it upon herself, you know, to play this philanthropic role um, to underprivileged people of color and um, to the city at large. So when she um, rented a helicopter and had cold coupons dropped off, you know, she didn't say, well, just just fly over the north side and make sure, you know, the disadvantaged color people get, you know, coupons. She had the plane flown over the entire city. And I, I just, I really, really respect and admire her, um, her generous spirit. That's what makes her story worth knowing. Um, I jokingly talk to people and say, You know, she was kind of like the Oprah Winfrey of her day, the Oprah Winfrey of her town, you know, just doing good um, and giving back and not just consuming. So, yeah, a lot to like about her. And um, what's it like writing a a book like this? It was easy to want to know more about a person who looks like me. I aspire to do a lot of the same things with my life as Madam Sarah Spencer Washington has done, not necessarily get into the hair care business, but to be, you know, to be, um, to be able to have my own business and be in a position to give back in huge ways that help lots of people. So I was definitely looking at her with such great admiration, you know, it was almost like, um, she she mentored me from the grave in a way. So I pers- mm-hmm. you know, I personally um, fell in love with her journey. Um, the research probably on and off took me five to six years because of, um, alongside researching Madam Sarah Spencer Washington, I was writing another book. So um, I had to finish that up first. That's the chicken bone beach about the the segregated beach in Atlantic City. Yes, because that's how I stumbled stumbled upon her. So, and I, honestly, um, I feel like I could have continued to dig up more and more information about her had I just took a few more years to do so. Um, it was not mm-hmm. easy finding. <laughs> information um on her uh that there there were there were a lot of missing bits and pieces like and I, I never found like marriage records on her first marriage or um i could have very well visited her hometown i did talk to uh her her grandson and he was extremely um helpful but it was about five or six years and um, worked every moment of it and loved it so much that I've actually started to write a screenplay about it. Oh, that's great. And I've never written a screenplay before in my (laughs) life, but, you know, I talked to a few of my colleagues in film and journalism and got some, you know, pointers and advice because, um, I just thought I, um, as I researched her, I could just see, I could see it on screen. I could just see the story uh, uh, unfolding on, along with all of her very great 
successes. Her life did have challenges and a lot of really interesting and personal things happened to her as well as her family along the way. I just didn't want to focus on that in the book Mm -hmm. because I wanted to uh, give the facts about her story, her success. But, you know, I felt like there was enough drama around her family and her that it made it it a little more uh, juicy, you know, TV and movie and film. You know, we're looking for, we we like a great documentary, but but we like some meat and potato. We like some juicy, good stuff, too. And she has plenty of it in her background. Well, great. Besides um, what we talked about today, is there anything else that you feel um, listeners should know about uh, Sarah Spencer Washington? I really, really um, respect and appreciate the fact that, you know, she had a successor and a succession plan for her business, which a lot of executives uh, don't always have. And I think that's really important for the business world and for even the smallest of entrepreneurs to know and understand how very important it is to have a plan in place um, due to your demise in any way, shape, or form. And she, um, she had a very intricate and detailed wheel Um, as far as how she wanted to be, she went to the extremes of how much she wanted spent on her own funeral and what she'd like to wear. I thought that was really, really interesting. And she probably was worth a couple of million when she died. Um, And this is in like the 1950s, but she only wanted a thousand dollars spent on her funeral. Oh, yeah, she's very financially savvy. She tried to pay cash for almost everything she ever purchased. And we should uh, get into a bit on uh, just the this is kind of scope of what we're talking about here. Um, 45,000 agents selling Apex products at a certain point, businesses in uh, not just all over the U.S., but heavily involved in um, South Africa, Haiti, maybe other other parts of the world. Yeah. Um, huge business. Are there other extant parts of the business today? Are they been sold into other other businesses? The business was sold and pretty much um, dissolved down to, I would say, an, a very meager state prior to selling. Um, she put her adopted daughter in charge of the business, and for a while it was successful um, and I think some decisions were made on the on the higher level that weren't so um, profitable or, or lucrative and so certain stores just kind of um, once they ran out of inventory that was really it but her longest standing legacy from um, what I could gather from researching is that um, there were several of her beauty schools that she franchised to people in the one in Philadelphia, the Apex Beauty College in Philadelphia was in existence for about 65 years. Um, they, I think they didn't close their doors until the early 1980s. But I would have to say that that's her longest legacy is that um, those women who purchased the Apex Beauty School kept it going and did really well. Well, that's great. Um, Cheryl, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I want to thank you for listening, and we thank Cheryl Woodruff Brooks. The book is Golden Beauty Boss, the story of Madam Sarah Spencer Washington and the Apex Empire. It is from Sunbury Books, S-U-N-B-U-R-Y, Sunbury Press, um, based out of Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Check it out. You can get it on Amazon, of course, but you can also get it at www.sunburypress.com. 
Look out for the movie that uh, Cheryl Woodruff Brooks told us that she is writing about this uh, unique woman. And if you like the program, please tell someone about it and keep listening. <laughs>